How's it going, everyone? What is the best ETF for income investing? A dividend investing strategy. I previously made a video talking about the best dividend growth ETFs, but that's not for everyone. Some of us care more about having a steady stream of passive income. You know, to pay for our bills, to pay for our hobbies, to fund our retirement, to spoil our grandchildren, you get the picture. The goal is to produce the highest possible cash flow from your investments into your pocket. But how do we do this? That's a good question, Jim Bob. The the traditional train of thought is to invest in individual stocks. However, picking, researching, and choosing individual stocks can be time consuming and requires a lot of individual effort. Then, an ETF is not a bad idea because an ETF is a collection of stocks under one umbrella, which essentially does the job of stock selection for you. But you already knew that because you did your homework and you want to invest in an ETF. So, which high yield dividend ETF is the best for income? focus investors. The word best is super subjective, so to make this objective, best will be determined by this checklist. First, we are going to evaluate the strategy of the ETF and take a look at its top holdings. Second, we will review the ETF's past performance. You shouldn't live in the past, but my goodness, as a history nerd, you can learn a lot by studying what happened historically. And lastly, we will also compare their dividend histories because not all ETFs are created the same. Some are better quality than others, and some are more consistent than others. The popular high yield dividend ETFs in question. And by the way, each one of these dividend ETFs have a ridiculous dividend yield that even realty income would be jealous of. And yeah, you're right, size isn't everything, but a bigger, stronger, thicker dividend yield? matters. And by the way, these ETFs have weird titles, so I'm going to give them nicknames. The first one is going to be NUSI. The second one is XYLD. I'm going to call it Global X. Number three is RYLD. I'm going to call it Global Russ. And number four is QYLD. I'm going to call it Global NASDAQ. And number five is JEPI. I'm going to call him Jimmy. And number six is JEPQ. I'm going to refer to it as Morgan Q. And before we go into the first criteria, make sure Sure you get a quick refresher as to what a covered call is because that's the strategy of these ETFs. And I promise I made it easy to understand. Essentially, these ETFs sell call options. Their portfolios earn premiums from selling those contracts and you get those as dividends. So first up to the plate is NUSI. Their official title is Nationwide NASDAQ 100 Income ETF and they have been around since December of 2019. NUSI employs a caller options strategy for their ETF, which means there is less upside when the market rallies, but also less downside when the market crashes. In theory, they should be more resistant to crashes. It is not designed to grow capital. Rather, its focus is on supplying a decent dividend. So the ETF stock price should remain somewhere in the $20 ballpark range, and the distribution yield should stay at a high single-digit number if everything goes well. Although there's a huge difference between buying in at $29 a share versus $20 a share. And they protect the portfolio against massive downswings by buying monthly protective puts. So they play bull and bear on their holdings, which are stocks in the NASDAQ 100, which tend to be tech focused. And for the past 20 years, the tech industry has been dominating. However, the NASDAQ 100 tends to be more volatile than the other industries. But anyways, by playing both sides of the field, they never quote unquote lose. I'll go into details later on in the video if their strategy actually works or not. And you're absolutely correct. I basically said the same thing in like three different ways. It's a contrast strategy. Newsy pays a monthly dividend and their current dividend yield is roughly 7%. And Newsy has 107 different holdings in their portfolio, which is influenced by the NASDAQ 100. Their portfolio valuation is the smallest out of all the ETFs in this video at $412 million, which mind you is funny money. That's a lot. And something that I want to mention and call out is that their fund managers are actually employed by a company called Neos Investment that was founded in 2022. So the fund is sponsored by Nationwide, but it's managed externally. And when we look at the top 10 holdings of Newsy, I can't complain. Every single one of these companies are winners. Although personally, I don't like Amazon, but I can't deny the fact that they are a winner. 
Next up is Global X. Their real name is the Global X S&P 500 Covered Call ETF. Now, Global X has been around since June of 2013. They also pay a monthly dividend, and the current yield is roughly 10%. I know, it's crazy. And the portfolio for Global X follows the S&P 500, if you couldn't already tell by their official title. Essentially, the giants of the stock market. And now, here's where it gets interesting. They do the classic covered call option strategy to get investors their monthly dividend. However, unlike Newsy, they do not buy puts against their holdings. So there are about 504 different holdings in their portfolio. And when we look at their top 10, once again, I am a fan of what I am seeing. And that's because they're replicating what the actual S&P 500 is. And I'm going to expose myself. I can't hide my bias. My personal favorite index is the S&P 500 because I like the inclusion criteria metrics and the performance. It's also referred to as the market because it's the benchmark to beat. But that does not mean that I like Global X. We still have a lot more ETFs to review. Oh, and the portfolio valuation is about $2.77 billion. Next up is Global Russ. Its true name is the Global X Russell 2000 Covered Call ETF, and it has been around since April of 2019. And speaking of Russ, the most recent potato variety to join the list of approved McDonald's potato varieties is the Dakota Russet. It is a small hill that I am willing to pick up my shield and axe for but McDonald's has the best french fries out of all the fast food establishments. Anyways, unlike the first two ETFs, this portfolio does covered calls with small cap companies in the US stock market that belong to the Russell Index, meaning companies that tend to be more volatile as they're not established or consistent with their financial performance. Global Russ pays a monthly dividend and has a yield in the ballpark of 12.5%. My goodness. They have about 1,951 holdings in their portfolio, which means they are doing this covered call strategy across many different companies. It must be absolutely chaotic for their Tuesday morning meetings when they talk about these companies. However, when we look at their top 10 holdings, I'm going to be honest, I am not a fan of what I see. They do not get a kiss on the cheek. It's a hard pass for me. And if you are wondering how Global Russ is able to get such a high dividend yield payout, well, that's because the Russell index is more volatile, right? Because that's the nature of small cap companies. So on the flip side of that is big risk, big reward. It kind of reminds me of short men. The shorter you are, the greater the desire to be someone great, powerful, and influential. Maybe I'm just projecting. Anyways, the portfolio valuation is roughly $1.41 billion. Next up is Global NASDAQ, aka QYLD. Their official name is Global X NASDAQ 100 Covered Call ETF, and they have been around since December of 2013. They also pay a monthly dividend, and its current yield is about 11.5%. The portfolio follows the NASDAQ 100, similar to Newsy, and they have about 102 holdings in their portfolio. And assets under management is about $7.97 billion. That's a lot. And then, of course, it's Jimmy, a.k.a. JEPI. Their official name is the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. And they came to life during the pandemic on May 2020. They pay a monthly dividend and its current yield is about 8%. The portfolio loosely follows the S&P 500. And I say loosely because they use the index as a reference. So they are engaging in the art of stock picking more so than the other ETFs that we talked about so far, which try to emulate the index pound for pound. Jimmy tries to select stocks based on their financial models to figure out which S&P 500 stocks are the most undervalued at the current time instead of just going balls in on all 500. The portfolio has roughly 131 holdings. This is an interesting strategy. When I look at their top 10 holdings, it is all over the place, but it makes sense. I can see there is a bias for high growth companies. By far the most popular popular of all the ETFs we discussed so far and the biggest as they have $30.52 billion of assets under management. And finally, it's Morgan Q. The JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity Premium Income ETF was born in May of 2022. It's an infant. It's only been around for about two years. But something tells me that the new kid on the block is going to apply lessons learned from the other older covered call ETFs and maybe do things the right way. And what do you know? It also pays a monthly dividend and it's 
current yield is about 9%. Portfolio has 95 holdings and they pick their stocks based on the NASDAQ 100. The assets under management is sitting at about $8.44 billion. So you're probably thinking, who is the winner here? It's hard to pick one as they all deploy the same strategy of covered calls. Although, Newsy does stand out because they do calls and puts. So for the time being, I'm just going to say it's a draw across the board. Actually, never mind. I'm not going to give a weasel answer. I like what Jimmy is doing. Referencing the S&P 500, but only investing in the undervalued companies. I actually like this strategy. It makes a lot of sense to me. So that's a point for Jimmy. I'll review my ranking after we go through all of the metrics instead of after each one. And now we are going to take a look at each ETF's past performance. I'm going to throw this disclaimer out there. Total return is kind of biased because the goal of covered call ETFs ETFs is to generate income rather than capital gains. As a result, their dividend yield is what carries them. I suppose we could evaluate them based on their ability to only produce an income. But no, I want to see what happens when we take into consideration their capital appreciation alongside their dividend. Because here's where I'm coming from. What's the point of having a high dividend yield if your principal amount invested into the ETF shrinks year after year? So for me, the total return is a valid criteria to measure the various ETFs because at the end of the day, the portfolio's total returns, which includes all unrealized capital gains and distributed income, are the most important consideration for future cash value. So I care about the total return. And I also care about puppies and shelters. So let's go ahead ahead and see what happened. So Newsy's five-year total return is 28%. When we break that down year over year, that's a 6.23% CAGR. And CAGR stands for Compound Annual Growth Rate, which is the total return you see for that year once you reinvest all of the profits and dividends back into the investment. So a 6% CAGR is not that good. Next up is Global X, and on a timeline of 11 years, they had a 108% total return. When we break that down year over year, that's a 6.68% CAGR. Not great, but at least it's better than Nusi so far. And now, this is where things get really ugly. This is Global Russ. For their five-year total return, you're looking at 15%. And when you break that down year over year, their CAGR is barely 3%, just shy of 3%, actually. If you don't know anything about about investing, just know that this is an ugly picture to see. And yes, this is the ETF that has a dividend yield above 12%. And when we investigate as to what happened to Global Russ, back in 2019, they used to trade for about $25 a share. And when you fast forward during the pandemic, they crashed alongside every other company out there. But Global Russ made a comeback during 2021 going into 2022. And since then, they have just been selling off quarter after quarter and currently they now trade for $16 a share. This is why I say the total return is important because capital appreciation matters. And when we look at global NASDAQ, their total return in 11 years has been 109%. Not bad. And when you break that down, it's a 7.67% CAGR year after year. So far, they have shown the best performance. And now we move on to the popular and hyped Jimmy. Now in four years, Jimmy had a 56% total return. And when you break that down, their CAGR is just shy of 10%. That is actually quite good. So better than global NASDAQ and a lot better than the other ETFs so far. And last but not least, we have Morgan Q. And Morgan Q is the new player on the roster. They've only been around for a little less than two years. However, their total return has been 25% and their CAGR is 12%. This is phenomenal. And the final metric we will judge the ETFs by is the dividend history. As a dividend investor, this is the most important metric. Such as when you're considering your first home purchase, the location of the neighborhood truly matters. If you buy your house on the wrong side of town, you're going to be in for a fun time. Such as waking up at 2 a.m. to police sirens, 3 a.m. to a helicopter in the air, and random gunshots throughout the night. Location matters. Likewise, the dividend record helps us as investors to make 
make a prediction about their future returns. Normally, we would avoid evaluating a company based solely on their dividend yield. Because if we do that, it usually ends up being a dividend trap, like making a decision with beer goggles on. But for these covered call ETFs, you must judge them by their dividend yield because their mission is to provide income and not necessarily grow in share price. So their dividend yield is their standard and quality. We will also look at their dividend growth to see what we might expect going forward. So first up is going to be Nusi. Nusi's average dividend yield since inception is sitting at 7%, which is not bad. However, when we look at their dividend growth, that tells a different story story. And what I see is inconsistency. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. And then we have Global X. And since Global X has been born, their average dividend yield is sitting at 6.55%. And when we look at their dividend growth over the years, this is the payout number that you see on top. I would say that it wasn't very good in the beginning, as you can see, like a dollar payout, a dollar 89. But as you fast forward throughout the years, it looks like they finally figured out their strategy because because as of recently, their dividend payouts are looking rather juicy. And next up is Global Rust. When we look at their average dividend yield throughout the years, it's just shy of 13%. It's amazing, right? But then you saw earlier what happened to their share price. And when we look at their dividend growth and the payouts, I would say from 2019 to 2022, things looked amazing. However, in 2023, that's a huge cut. So I would label their dividend growth as unreliable. There is a high yield, but 2023 proved that Global Rust cannot sustain or grow the dividend payout. And then we have Global NASDAQ. Their average dividend yield throughout the years is sitting at 10.48%. And their dividend growth, when I look at this picture, it's actually not half bad. So I would say their dividend growth and their strategy to get that payout is somewhat consistent. If you buy into Global NASDAQ, based on their history, you can expect a dividend payout to be around $2.20 to upwards of $2.50. And then we have the homecoming king. Jimmy. Their average dividend yield is sitting at 8%. And when we look at their dividend payout, all I can say is that it's inconsistent. Although it had a really high payout in 2022, they were not able to emulate that the next year because it went down by a lot. And finally, it's Morgan Q. Now, Morgan Q's average dividend yield is sitting at 10%, and they've only been around for a little less than two years. However, what's amazing is that Morgan Q actually grew their dividends in 2023, whereas every other ETF, their dividends went down in 2023. So what kind of magic Morgan Q is doing? I don't know, but I like what I see. And before you become a keyboard warrior, understand that I am not invested in any of these covered call ETFs. ETFs. I do not have an agenda. I might be wrong, but this is how I would rank them. To get this out of the way, I'd say Global Rust is by far the worst. Yes, their dividend yield is juicy, but the ETF share price has been getting crushed to compensate for it. Global Rust had an ugly Kager and even worse total returns. Then I'd say Nusi is not even worth taking a look at because their option caller strategy did not even work as intended in 2021 to 2022. Too. I'll tell you more about this in a minute. Also, Nusi's dividend payout has been decreasing year after year. This is a red flag. I would not feel safe nor comfortable putting a penny into that ETF. Their strategy works in theory, but on paper it shows otherwise because it's extremely difficult to execute. By playing both sides of the field, Nusi is like a far-right Republican and a leftist Democrat getting married. Can the union actually work out? Actually, that's a pretty good question. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section. And if I had to pick a winner out of this group of ETFs, which I wouldn't in real life, but if you forced me to with a hammer next to my knees, then I would begrudgingly pick Morgan Q. Their dividend payout is the only ETF that increased in 2023 when the others went down and their Kager was looking phenomenal. Although their history is super short, so who knows if they can stay consistent with their performance. With that said, I like this covered call option strategy the best, 
on the NASDAQ 100 because of the volatility of the upside. The more volatility there is, the higher the premiums for the call options. And I cannot predict the future. However, I think Morgan Q will have a decent future ahead of them. And if a participation trophy is necessary, then their cousin Jimmy would take second place. I suppose Jimmy is popular for a good reason. I can see what the other investors see in them. They're actually not half bad. So besides Morgan Q and Jimmy, the rest of these ETFs are a hard pass for me. Like that one time I took a shot of moonshine in Puerto Rico with my commander. Never again will I sip on moonshine from any locals. That stuff is really potent. But I must say, Puerto Rico is an amazing place though. Totally worth the visit. Wait, hold up. Why am I being so harsh to these covered call ETFs? At this point, before you tap dislike on this video, please give me a chance to explain myself, good sir. Let's go ahead and take a look at how these ETFs performed against the index they are applying their covered call strategy to. First up is the NASDAQ 100, which are mostly tech companies with no finance companies included. The timeline that you see on your screen is January 2020 to January 2024. The QQQ is the most popular ETF when it comes to the NASDAQ 100 because its holdings are nearly identical to the index itself. And we're going to be comparing the QQQ to the global NASDAQ and NUSI. And when we look at the data and the numbers, QQQ has beaten the socks off of both NUSI and global NASDAQ. In a four-year timeline, if you had just invested 10 grand into QQQ, then it would be worth $20,000. If you had put that same $10,000 into NUSI or global NASDAQ, then it would be worth roughly $12,000 each. And during QQQ's best year, they went up by 55%. Whereas during NUSI's best year, they only went up by 31%. And global NASDAQ only went up by 23%. And when you look at the year-over-year -year average Kager, it's just not even a contest. It's like a Division I FBS football team playing their preseason game against a Division II local program. But wait, there's more to the tale. What you see on your screen are the annual returns for the ETFs in question. Blue is NUSI, red is global NASDAQ, and orange is the NASDAQ 100, aka QQQ. So do you remember how NUSI applies the playing both sides of the field strategy? And the whole idea is to protect you from the catastrophic downsides with their puts. However, when we look at 2022, NUSI actually had a negative 28% rate of return in their worst year, whereas the global NASDAQ had negative 19% in their worst year. Isn't NUSI supposed to have less of a drop than, say, global NASDAQ, who only did covered calls? Although, they did beat global NASDAQ in performance in this timeline by a tiny amount, which I think is pretty hilarious. If you look at 2020, NUSI beat global NASDAQ, and they were pretty much neck to neck in 2021. And last year, 2023, NUSI just absolutely dominated global NASDAQ, but fell short of QQQ by a lot. So all I'm trying to say is that if you had just invested into the NASDAQ 100, aka QQQ, you would have had better returns than these covered call ETFs. Again, let's try this with the S&P 500 to see how the covered call ETFs perform. So the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF is known as VU. So VU, which to my bias is my most favorite index, as everyone should already know, emulates the S&P 500. And we are comparing VU to Global X and Jimmy. And what do you know? The index itself beat the covered call ETFs. In a three and a half year timeline horizon, if you had put $10,000 into VU, then it would have been worth $16,840. However, that that same $10,000 would be worth $15,000 in Jimmy and $14,000 in Global X. And during VU's best year, the rate of return was 28%, whereas it was 21% for Jimmy and 19% for Global X. Underperforming the inherent index is designed by choice into these covered call ETFs, but it's worth highlighting to show what you're getting yourself into if you invest in covered call ETFs. And please just take a knee and look at the year over year year Kager between these various ETFs. VU sits at about 15%, Global X sits at about 9%, and Jimmy at 12%. What was interesting to me was that although Jimmy trailed VU in terms of upside, their downside was a lot less than VU during their worst moment in 2022. 
blue. You see on your screen right now, blue is Jimmy, red is Global X, and orange is VU. And when we look at 2022, just look at the difference in downside. Jimmy was actually able to protect themselves from going down further than the actual market. And not just by a little bit, but by a significant margin. The strategy of covered calls, if done right, shows how it reduces and protects against the downside. Jimmy's worst year was negative 3.53%, whereas the worst year for VU was negative 18.19%. I'm not going to lie, this is pretty impressive. Sure, your upside is not going to be as high as the index. However, your downside won't be as tragic as the index as well. If you couldn't tell already, I am just not a fan of covered calls, nor the ETFs that generate a dividend because of that strategy. And it reminds me of how certain ETFs perform well during certain market conditions, such as when the interest rates were low back in 2020, Kathy Wood's ARK ETFs were crushing the competition with crazy returns. It almost seemed foolproof and safe on how consistent her returns were quarter after quarter, until it wasn't. And that's what I think of the covered call strategy. People think they're safe and foolproof, but I think it's just too much risk for me. Who knows, maybe with enough time, there's gonna be a development of an enemy strategy to go against this and to take advantage of all of these call options and drive them into the ground. And besides, the dividend output can't be fully forecasted because it's contingent upon the call option contract premiums and if people execute on their contracts. And there's so many other factors that go into it, and that's why their dividend payouts are not consistent. And what I mean by that is the trends or the pattern. It's not always going up. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. I'd rather sacrifice a little dividend yield and just go with SCHD. Or if high yield is important to me, I'd rather go with BDCs like Maine or ARC or a normal company like Altria. The histories of these covered call high yield dividend ETFs are just too short. We do not know how they will perform when the external circumstances are going to change. I think what's happening right now is investors are piling in because they see the high yield dividend number and they think this method methodology of investing is completely safe, which I do not agree with. I don't think it's safe at all. Call options and puts, in my opinion, is in the territory of gambling. You have a timeline in which the stock price needs to hit or exceed, and for you to forecast those numbers, it's pure speculation. And as a dividend growth investor, I like the idea of buy and hold set and forget to have a long-term investing horizon of 10 to 20 years with all my investments. With day trading and doing call options, it's very short-term or speculative in nature. I'm not a fan. I like to keep it simple. And that's my rule of thumb in life as well. For me, I'd rather just invest in a solid company with amazing numbers growing year after year that's predictable. And I can live my life knowing I am leaving gains on the table by not participating in covered call options. I am not oblivious. I know for a fact you can make a fortune overnight by trading call options or put options. But I just don't swing that way. It's out of my comfort zone and risk profile. So to answer the original question, what is the best ETF for income investing? I'm going to go ahead and say that it's SCHD. Just do SCHD and call it a day. I know the dividend yield isn't as juicy as Global X or Jimmy or any of these other covered call ETFs, but the strategy behind SCHD is a lot more simple and easier to understand. And sometimes less is more. To prove my point, let's go ahead and take a look at the most popular and biggest covered call ETF, which is Jimmy, and compare that to SCHD to see what would happen. In the same timeline horizon, I'll admit the performance is is pretty close. 10 grand invested into SCHD or Jimmy would spit out a final balance difference of only $1,376. SCHD's best year, however, blew Jimmy out of the water with a 29% return versus 21% for Jimmy. And when we look at their Kager, again, 
SCHD beat Jimmy. So the blue represents Jimmy and the red is SCHD. And what's funny is SCHD's worst year in 2022 was actually better than Jimmy's as well. Remember, the appeal behind covered call ETFs are that investors believe them to be safe, steady sources of income because they protect against catastrophic downturns. Yet, a popular dividend ETF like SCHD proved to be better in times of volatility. Funny how that played out. I will give credit where it's due though. In 2023, Jimmy actually beat SCHD by a lot. But when we look at 2020 and 2021, SCHD beat Jimmy. If you are curious about SCHD, then please do check out my video that I made about them. I really did not want to like SCHD, but after doing my research on them, I cannot deny how gorgeous and beautiful they are. And here's the kicker. I am not even invested in SCHD at the moment. However, one day I'd like to be invested in SCHD. Anyways, this has been Dividend Compounders with Cheese. Stay safe and I'll talk to you next time.